Okay. Um, so the the recess, uh, the time that we're going to take for the time change, is going to start in March 12th, this Sunday, according to the posting by uh, by John. And then it's going to end the 25th. So then our next meeting is going to be, I was checking the calendar, the next meeting is going to be March 31st, which is Friday. After that, that 25th, which, which falls on Saturday. Okay. Okay, so we're going to have two, almost three weeks. <laughs> okay. okay, but that, that could give us some time to do some exercises on this chapter. So I don't think, you know, uh, I, I think those two weeks are going to be a, a benefit for well, for for you and me because you know I, I haven't I haven't done any exercises in this chapter. Okay, I see that there's someone uh, Abdul uh, for the dynamic regression models. Uh, uh, do, mm. Yeah, but Abdul, you know, is is able <laughs> as Andres too. Okay, so what do you mean? Is is going to take the session or or not? I didn't... Probably not. I haven't heard of him. I haven't heard of Andres and, and Abdul. So I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't expect them, you know, to to be joining joining us. Okay, so. okay. I can do the session if you like. If you if you if we don't do yeah, let, let, let's see because what, what we're doing right now is you know I, I'm going to you know talk about uh, chapter seven. Then when we come back, we're going to do the exercise, one of the exercises of chapter seven. And then probably you are going to be doing the next chapter, chapter uh, eight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Which is, uh, I believe, it's exponential smoothing. Okay. I wanted to do the ARIMA models. So do you want to do that? Uh, yeah, I can do the, the, the ARIMA. Yeah, no problem. Okay. 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 So you can, you can do the exponential and you'll have a benefit because I already did it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, we so are if, if you go, the... if you go to the GitHub, let me post it there. If you go to my GitHub, uh, you will get the, you will see, you know, what I posted. And I think it's in the notes, you know, in the, in, in the book, book notes. Okay. Okay. I just okay, so let me let me post uh, the Google uh, the Google sheet uh, with the thing. So Ricardo yeah. and I'm going to do the dynamic as well. Okay. Yeah. Let Let's see how how we you know how how do we do you know uh, each each of us you know doing doing each chapter uh, depending on how you know the sequence goes then you know we'll decide. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because I see that this uh, the Google Sheet is not updated. So today, uh, right? Um, so, uh, today is the tenth. Okay, so we need to shift everything down to. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. So ma ma March thirty first, which is when we reconvene after the the time changes and everything, we're going to do an exercise of chapter seven yeah yeah okay yeah. want to cover and then the next friday then you'll have the chance to talk about chapter eight okay okay so we, we talk about theory and then you know apply it apply it to the exercises mm -hmm. okay yeah. i'm just so this uh the the chapter six we didn't um no, the chapter six is called judgmental forecast, and it's not related to any mathematical model. Mm -hmm. It's when you know you have to use other non-mathematical tools uh, to do a you know to do a forecast. Uh, for our case, I don't think that's that's relevant because in our case we're talking about time series and we're talking about algorithms, mathematical algorithms. Okay, so we skip uh, intentionally. We skip that that chapter. You can read it, but it's yeah. not a 
is 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 another an, an, another topic in terms of uh, you know predictions. Okay. Okay. Let's let's have a uh, let's see if I do. Okay. And um, I just uh, set up the the Google Sheet. Okay. We we'll have a look at it. Um, Let me check. I can put the, the link in the chat. Okay, let me see. Aha, uh -huh, no meeting, no meeting. And then, uh, okay, I think we have to add, uh, add some dates there. <laughs> okay. Because the schedule is just, you know, uh, you know, ro rolling over. Uh, no, 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 because I did wrong. So okay. Plus seven. Okay, so now it's fine. Okay, so but the 31st, we're not going to discuss exponential smoothing. We're going to do the, the exercises, one exercise from chapter seven. Okay, so I add. Uh, uh -huh. I, right. Okay. So exactly. And that's going to be uh, the exercise, yes. Uh, where do we specify that this is the exercise as, as the same as here? Yeah, we just repeat the, the chapter, okay? Uh, yeah, okay. So then Yeah, we just repeat the chapter. The same thing for a exponential small thing for a rima, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So we can have some, some practice. That's the... That's the reason. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so all, all good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so let me share my screen. Let me put it uh, where it should just, be. Uh, 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 on your GitHub, and it said confirm your account recovery settings, verify name. What does it say? It says I share I share the screen so you you can see what it's saying. Let me see. There you go. Confirm your account recovery setting. You you see that GitHub. Uh yeah, but that, that's for you. That's for your account. Uh okay. Do I need to confirm? Why yeah. Is that? Yeah, he's just asking you. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you want to do any recovery settings, you can do it later. Uh, ju just confirm. Yeah, but that, that that's that from your account. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So let's let's get busy. <laughs> okay. Let me see where am I? Okay. Here we go. Uh, okay, share screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes? Okay. So uh, we started in our previous session, we started to discuss some of the you know, the first topics of this chapter, which is titled Time Series Regression Models. And for future viewers, one book that I recommend, a booklet that I recommend that you should, you know, participate before entering in other book clubs is the uh, Introduction to Statistical Learning. Because there, uh, especially, specifically in chapter three, they talk in detail about what is a regression. So this book is not going to give you that information because it already assumes that you know something about regression models, okay? The thing is that these regression models are going to be them applied to the particular setting of the time series. As we have talked before in the previous chapters, remember that time series, the only difference that it has from regular data is that it has a temporal component, okay? A, a date or a time that you are going to be you know, working in sequence from, from those observations. Those observations have that sequence 
that cannot be, uh, you know, you, you cannot alter, you cannot uh, uh, alter that, that, that sequence. So in the book, that section is divided into these topics, which are the learning objectives that the author recommends. It, the, first, the first one is how to develop a linear model uh, regarding time series. Then we're going to talk about developing some useful predictors because as we have seen time series, you can you know, uh, create lags, for example, create certain predictors from the value that you're trying to predict and also from the date that you're trying to predict, depending on the period uh, of the date. You can create certain predictors that are unique to a time series, and then they can be used for the linear models. We're going to be talking about the residuals, right? Because in regression, you have certain assumptions. The residuals have to behave randomly. They have to uh, fit a Gaussian or normal distribution and all that, right? And the variance to be constant, constant, et cetera. So those are the assumptions of a regression. And you're going to see that in the residual diagnostics. If your model complies with that assumption or uh, breaks some of the assumptions. And more or less, the book doesn't say it, but I can tell you how to, how to deal with it. Then uh, we're going to talk about sele uh, selecting predictors, feature selection, and forecast evaluation, forecasting with regression, and then correlation, which is not causation. Correlation is not causation. That's one of the maxims here. Then there's another chapter called matrix formulation. Uh, I put in parentheses, refer to textbook chapter 7.9, because that's basically a reference of the mathematical formulas that are uh, you know, implied in regression models. Uh, I don't think we should have, you know, we, we should spend more too much time uh, there. So that's going to be part of your, you know, reading material. But it's good information just to make sure that, you know, the matrix formulation is, going, is not going to be covered. We're going to, co we're going to cover only until the correlation. Okay, good. Check, good. All right. So what is in the simple, simplest terms, a regression model? Well, a regression model has two components, a predictor, right? The observation, the predictor, and the variable that we want to predict, okay? Which is the target, uh, usually in regression, right? As, as, as we know, usually the target is numerical, right? Okay, this is not classification, this is regression. And the target is numerical. And we have a predictor X that is going to be the basis for predicting uh, Y, uh, our target. So this is a, 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 a visualization of a linear model. So you have X variable, right? With X magnitude, and then you have a Y. When you visualize it in a scatter plot, you're going to get this kind of uh, visualization, right? Different points when they intersect, right? The X and the Y, when they intersect, that's a point. And then, you know, you get the whole, the whole scatter uh, area. And what linear regression is trying to do is trying to fit a line within those points that minimizes the sum of the errors to the square, okay? It's going to try to minimize the sum of the errors to the square. And that's the best fitting line for that kind of uh, relationship between X and Y, okay? Or correlation between X and Y. And we have seen it before, right? Uh, we have Y equal intercept plus some coefficient uh, multiplied by x, the coefficient is the slope, the, uh, the beta naught is the, that, that, that constant is the intercept, okay, which would be around here. And then you get that linear function to predict y uh, values, all right? So the example that the book gives, gives us 
is an example of US consumption expenditure. And in that uh, Sybil, right? In that data frame as a time series Sybil, we have the date component, which is quarter, the consumption, uh, I think someone is mowing the lawn here. So, you know, pardon for the, for the background noise. So it's going to be the quarter. You cannot hear it? Okay, good. Apparently the microphone is filtering, that's good. No, I don't hear it. Uh, yeah, because I, I can't hear it, you know, he's blowing everything there. Okay, anyway, the time component is, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> the periods are by quarter, in other words, by three months. That's the period that we have. So we have quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and so forth by year, sequential. Then we have our target, which is consumption, but also we have other information, other time series that depend, you know, relate to income, to production, to savings, and to unemployment. Okay, so <clears throat> In the simplest terms, linear regression, not multiple regression, in linear regression, what we're going to, to do is try to forecast consumption on future periods, sorry, future periods consumption with the data that we have, with observations that we have. And this data corresponds, sorry, corresponds from 1970 quarter one, 2010, 19 quarter two. Let me take a sip because my throat is really messed up. <laughs> okay. So that's that's our that, that's our data set. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that we have to do is plot, right? Plot our our time series. And we're going to plot the time series by that period right, from 1970 to 2019. But also we want to take a peek at the other time series that is income. What can we see from the plot that we have right here? What will be, what will be your comment, Federica? Okay, my, my, my first, so uh, my okay. first comment is they, they, they quite going, uh, they quite similar. Right. So, except that income has a larger peaks, but they follow the same trend. Okay. So yeah. So we have consumption, which is kind of the red orange, you know, a line there, and we have also some periods where there is, you know, some magnitude that has a has a you know has kind of a larger magnitude in income, in consumption, but also in income. So it's going to be good to try to see <clears throat> what kind of re uh, correlation uh, do they have, these two time series, to see if one is a good predictor, you know, it, it can be a good predictor of the other. So let's see. Okay, so in this, we're going to do just a linear, a linear uh, uh, model, okay? so. Right now, what we're trying to do is trying to predict consumption, right? Consumption by the variable income. So X is going to be the income, consumption is going to be the Y, all right? But also you can do a model with the date and consumption and then try to forecast it, right? But it's not going to be a linear regression this, because you only have one, one vector. You need two vectors, you need X and Y, okay? So in some of the models that we're going to see, for example, exponential smooth, smoothing, ARIMA, et cetera, although they, you know, ARIMA has some auto regression, uh, they don't need, you know, that extra regressor, okay? J they just need a date, the date to make the trend and make the seasonality, et cetera. But in this case, we need two vectors. We need the X vector, the predictor, and then we need the Y, which is the target. Income is the predictor, uh, consumption is the target in this case. So we're going to use just base R to try to get a model 
a regression model, income explaining consumption. And this is the, this is the formula, right? That we have, we have seen before, a base R, LM. And the data, of course, is US change, but it's change as a table. In other words, you know, we, we are not dealing with the quarter, uh, the, the temporal component, we're dealing just with those two things. So the summary of the model, it gives you some information, right? It gives you the adjusted R square, which is 0.429, which is not that, you know, that hot, right? Uh, usually we want a higher R square for our models, but that, that's what it is. Then we have the income uh, X, right? The income X, and it says that is highly significant. In other words, it has three stars, highly significant. So that means that that coefficient, that estimate, right? The coefficient, the slope, that means that the probability that that, that coefficient is zero is very, very unlikely. Okay, so if you get that estimate with the standard error, you'll see that the standard error doesn't touch uh, zero, okay? And we have seen this already. If you are taking that core, that, that book club, we have seen this. Uh, yeah, I would like to yeah. um, mm -hmm. say that uh, that's 27%, right? <laughs> So uh -huh. we can say that uh, consumption will increase up 27% for each uh, unit of income. Yeah. Correct. Correct. That, that's what the model is saying. Okay. But but we have to be very careful because we have very low R square here. Okay. So the variance that the model is, is explaining is that number. Okay. It's around 14%, which is not that shabby. Okay, <laughs> it's not that 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 you know I, I don't feel very comfortable with this. <laughs> okay, even though the the income is 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 uh, according to the model, you know, it is a, it's a good prediction, right? Okay, because it's significant, it's a significant prediction. But maybe we need to you know to do some some other things. But since we're talking about the time series here, in other words, there's a sequence that you cannot you know uh, uh, alter, right? So let's see. Uh, okay, th this is the line. Okay, I'm talk I, I was thinking about another slide, but this is this is the line that is going to be fitted by this model. Okay, that's the slope, 0 0.27, etc. And those are the points. And as you can see, there's a lot of points that the line is not capturing. In other words, th those the scatter plot, the points are not that you know converging into that line. Maybe that's why that R square is, is, is low. But since we're talking about a time series, we can do this. We can do a cross correlation, okay? That's something that we don't do in the regular regression models because there's no time component, the date component. So in base R, this is this function CCF, which is a cross correlation between two vectors, two time series, okay? And what it's going to give you is, you know, beginning with the lag zero, which is the lag zero is the value with itself, right? Which is always, you know, uh, correlated, right? So that value is going to be lag to the, you know, to the forward side, you know, for, forward uh, lag and backward lag. And that's why you have, negative values here, negative lags and positive lags. And as you can see in this model, one and three and negative one and three have a strong correlation in terms of the lags between those two time series, okay? So one way to improve this model from this information is to incorporate those lags, right? If we incorporate those lags, like one, like three, minus one, minus three, I bet you that the model is going to be there, that our adjusted square is going to increase. Okay, that will be you know the, the 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 way to interpret this because those lags are reinforcing that correlation. In other words, they're adding you know to that correlation here in in lag zero. All right. 
So this is another, you know, uh, this is this is this is the base R function, and then this is the one with the auto plot. The auto plot, as, as you see, basically is the same. You know, uh, it has some some changes, but it's, it's basically the same uh, uh, function. And this is CF. I believe it comes is in capital letters. It comes from one of the packages that we're studying uh, here. All right. <clears throat> So it's important for when we deal about with time series to verify the lags, okay? Because the lags could be a method to create new predictors to increase our, you know, uh, forecast accuracy in the future. All right, you have to incorporate those lags. Okay. Any comment, questions? Uh, no. Okay. Okay, so let's move on. Right, so we talk about linear regression, right? We have an X predictor, we have a Y, the target. Now we're going to, you know, add some complexity to the model. And we're going to now talk about multiple regression. And multiple regression, what it does is that instead of it's having one predictor, now we have several. Uh, predictors, which uh, taking, you know, that the chapter three from uh, Introductions of Statistical Learning, uh, it could improve the model, but also it creates other issues, right? Now we have the issue of multicollinearity, etc. So in multiple regression, even though we have more predictors to add to the mix, we have to watch if some of the predictors are highly correlated. If they're highly correlated, then your model could have problems, right? So in this case, remember that we have that, uh, that table that had consumption, had income, had savings, as unemployment. So now we're going to see all those, you know, the, the, the other, the other uh, time series, the production time series, the savings and the unemployment, which is, you know, plot in this uh, in this vision. All right. Okay. So let's see how we can do a little bit of analysis, exponential analysis, with these predictors. So we have this pair plot from the G uh, G Galley uh, package, and we have seen it in other chapters. In fact, the, apparently the author is very, you know, uh, keen to use it. And we're going to see the correlations and also the, the tendency, right, that each of these predictors have within each other. We have consumption, we have income, we have production, we have savings, and we have unemployment. Okay, Federica, so looking at, at this pair plot, can you identify which is which pair of predictors have the highest correlation? Which pair of predictors have the highest correlation? Yeah, my my dog, my dog knows. He wants to. My what? My dog. Can you hear me? Oh, your dog. Okay, <laughs> your dog is, is making noises now. Okay. okay, well, I don't hear that that much, so it's good. Okay. <laughs> So I have um, so this this um, the this is the density, right? The what? The the the, 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 um, the density distribution, and then we have oh, okay the, okay in the middle in the diagonal yeah you have the distribution okay. of each of the of of the of the time series right you know okay. of the of the predictors okay. Uh, I mean, consumption is the target. You have predictors, income, production, savings, and unemployment. But that diagonal, yeah, is the distribution. You're correct. Okay. So I can see that uh -huh. the distributions are uh, the, the income, production, and saving. Uh, so they... they uh, um, so income and savings are quite similar. And uh, why, if I look at the, um, uh, the, the, the the smooth, okay, 
I can uh -huh. see that uh, income and production uh, are quite. Uh... Okay, let, let me let me give you some help. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This quadrant here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Yeah. yeah can you see my mouse? Ah yes, yes, of course, yes. The, yes okay, yes. because uh, yeah, I yeah. don't know if I if I can if I can you know draw a line here. Let me see. Okay, annotate. Good. Yeah. Uh, so, so okay. Maybe, okay. Draw. Draw. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. This upper quadrant here. Aha. Uh -huh. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this upper quadrant here, what it gives you is the correlations between each of, of the of, you know, the time series that we're dealing. So mm -hmm. it's going to give you, for example, if you want to know the correlation between consumption and unemployment, this is the correlation, mm -hmm. okay? Which is negative. Mm -hmm. In other words, if one goes up, the other one goes down. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a negative relationship, right? Mm -hmm. This one, for example, this one is between production and income. Okay, what they mean. All right. And this one has 0.269. So it's positive. So they go both in the same direction, but it's not a very strong correlation. Okay. Usually strong correlations are within 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and of course one, which is the perfect uh, correlation. They go down to zero and then they can go negative too. If one goes up and the other one goes down, that could be a negative uh, correlation. So with that explanation, can you tell me which pair of predictors, which pair of predictors have ha, has the highest correlation? Okay, obviously I can see now. I okay. Savings and income. Uh, Very good. They have like seventy-two percent of correlation. So, okay, but that's the in terms of magnitude, in terms of absolute value, that's the second highest correlation. There's one that is higher. Uh, okay, I, I don't see which one. I don't. Uh, check out, check out this one. Okay, I. Uh... Yeah, this is minus. Okay, they they. This is okay, because I, my, my question was which has the highest. Okay, okay. I didn't say the highest positive. I said okay. the highest. So in terms of magnitude, an employment and production has the highest correlation. The only thing that is negative, but that's okay. Okay, in other words, when production goes high, unemployment goes down. When production goes down, unemployment goes high. It's like a seesaw, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like a seesaw, right? Yeah. yeah. And you can okay. see by the what? points, as, because they, they are following the, the smooth line, so the model line. And oh, yeah. You can see that they are, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you go, let's say production and employment, right? If you go here to unemployment, let me let me draw another 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 a line here okay if you go on employment and production right is this one all right so as you can see the correlation is negative right so that means that the slope is going to be negative too it's not going to be positive it's going to be negative all right, so this is a good uh, tool to get a, a sense on how correlated are, first of all, our predictors to the target, right? Okay, which is going to be the first line. The first line is going to give you, is consumption is the target. This line, the first line is going to give you the correlations of each of the other predictors with the target, you know, to, to get a sense of which ones are the highest, uh, correlated which are, are are not then but also it gives you information about the correlation within the predictors 
And then you can uh, you know, watch for certain predictors that are highly correlated. For example, I will watch production and unemployment and savings and income because they are highly correlated. Probably they will give me a little bit of problem, okay, with the model to, to, you know, to manage those assumptions, okay? Good? Good. So this is a good tool for, you know, assessing those two, uh, you know, th those two uh, uh, relationships, okay? In terms of correlation. <laughs> All right, let me see if I can uh, if I can erase that. I don't know if it goes away. <laughs> no, it doesn't go away. <laughs> let, let me let me let, let me let me raise that thing. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. Okay. So so what are the assumptions? I will be talking about residuals now. So what are the assumptions about the errors uh, or, or what we call the residual? It's the error between what the line is saying at a particular X and then the observed, right? The observed uh, point. The magnitude, the distance between the line and the, that point is going to be the error. So they, they have to have, when you plot those residuals in a sequence, because you have to, you have to do it in a sequence because it's a time series, they're going to have mean zero. And they shouldn't be uh, biased. In other words, they shouldn't go to a certain direction or another direction. So you know, they, they have to be they have to behave random. They're not autocorrelated, the residuals. The observations can be autocorrelated, but the residuals should not be. They should be unrelated to other predictors. And there's going to be some plots that we can do to see the residuals versus each of the predictors and see you know, if, if there's a pattern or not. And then that those residuals are going to follow a Gaussian distribution, normality, right? With a constant variance. Those are the assumptions. All right. So let's go back to the model. And now we're going to use a function called <laughs> This function, TSLM, which is time series linear model. <laughs> okay, linear model, but applied to a time series. Uh, basically the same as the as the LM, but you will see some differences. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to do the the you know we're going to use the the same the same uh, that data frame. Consumption is the target the y. Now we're going to add income, production, unemployment, and savings. And we're going to uh, fit it. We're going to create this fit. Fit cons consumption MR, a uh, multiple regression uh, model. And we're going to summarize or report it. In this case, there's a function called report that gives you more or less the same information as the summary. What we can see here, well, the first thing that we can see is that our R square really jump okay from the income that we have of 0 0.14 now we have 0 0.6 ah now, now we're now, now we're cooking right now we're talking then in terms of the the predictors income is still a significant predictor in other words that estimate is very high is highly unlikely that it's not going to be zero okay it is good then also, the savings are significant. The ones that are really not significant, in other words, that estimate could be zero, the coefficient could be zero, are production and unemployment. All right. So, in terms of feature importance, we can say that income and savings are important to the model, production and employment could not be that. That's significant, that, that important. Then let's do some plotting. Let me take this because you know it's kind of uh, annoying. <laughs> All right, so we have this function called augment. And what augment does is that it gives you 
the fitted values, which is the, the predictions, right? And also it gives you the residual values, point fitted, point received. If you look at that, it, at, at that augment, the output of the augment is going to give you the observed values and it's going to give you the fitted values, which is the, predict, the predictions, and then the residual values, which are the difference between the observed and the fitted. Then we're going to then plot consumption, right? Which is our target, the observed value. And we're going to also uh, plot the predicted uh, uh, values also. And then we're going to compare. Okay, so now, Federica, what do you see? Okay, so uh, the model uh, did a good job. Um, basically, it's following uh, the trend. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the feeder is following very closely, right? I mean, there there can be some some instances, right, that uh, we don't get the. Let me let me get this. Okay. Uh, okay, draw again. For example, in here, right? Uh, you can see some discrepancy, right? Right there. In other words, the fit is can is kind of going a little bit above what the observed values are. So that's a sign. That could be a sign of overfit. Mm -hmm. That could be a sign, right? <laughs> but in general, the 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 model is doing is doing much better, much better than what we saw with the consumption and the income. So our model is improving, and that's a good thing. All right. So let me erase this. Okay. So we're on the right track. We're in, on the right track. Now we're going to do the same, but now we're going to see the line that we're drawing in terms of the data, the observed values and the fitted value, the values. And we are going to see that now those points are a little bit closer to the line. That's why that adjusted square is higher because compared to the other one with the consumption and income, remember that they were all scattered around you know, the quadrant. Now they are more aligned to that, you know, to that, to that line. So also that's a good, that's a good sign. Now, when we talk about R squared, we talk about the coefficient of determination. And it is a, a metric that we can use to see how the model explains the variance, explains the variance of the observed values. If the R squared is high, in other words, is close to one, that means that that model is a good estimator of that variance. If the R square is going to zero, and there could be instances that is negative, which is a, you know, it's it's really a bad a really bad model. But usually, if we wait between zero and one, if it's close to zero, that means that the model uh, doesn't understand uh, the variance of the of the observed values. Okay, so in this case, because we have a point six seven six eight, that means that you know seventy six point eight percent of the time. The, the model is, is predicting uh, 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 the, the observed value, okay? So this is a function from the package, right? From the, from the, from the forecast, uh, for, for, forecast package that we're dealing with, which is a wrapper of the ggplot for time residuals. And it gives you three, three uh, plots. It gives you, the sequence of the, of the residuals. In this case, it's called innovation residuals because they could they, they are transformed, okay? You know, to accommodate, you know, this time, time series. As you can see, you know, they're fluctuating between more or less between 1.2 and less than negative one, all right? But what we want to do is try to see if there's a pattern here. If there's a pattern here, that means that the residuals are not behaving randomly. And that's a break on the assumption of the regression model. Then the second one is the lags, right? The lags 
of those residuals. If there's, a, if there's an instance where there's a strong lag between those residuals, that also means that the assumption of independence is not a, is, 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 is not a value, okay? And here we have one lag, lag seven, that has a stronger than the dotted lines, which is the, you know, the, the confidence intervals for the randomness, it's surpassing that. That means that that's a strong lag that the model is not captured. And then, of course, we have the, uh, you know, the histogram of the residuals to see if it fits uh, a, 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 a Gaussian uh, distribution, a normal distribution. As you can see, there's some skewness here. Uh, it's trying to go to the right. Okay, the skew is trying to go to the right because most of the points are a little bit grouped to the left. So in terms, this, those are the visual, uh, you know, analysis that you can, you, you, we can make. But we have also uh, hypothesis test uh, tools for, for testing that also can give us some, some idea if those assumptions in the analysis, the visual analysis are correct. So the first one is the Shapiro-Wilk normality test. Okay, it tests if any, you know, uh, you know, random vectors, uh, ve ve uh, numeric vector, in, in this terms, the residuals that the model is producing, if they behave on a, you know, if the, if the distribution is, is Gaussian or not, if it fits. So this is the formula, right? We're going to take, we're going to pull the point resid uh, column from the augment, which is the column that has the residuals. We're going to create a residuals vector. And then we're going to apply the Shapiro test, all right? What it says here is that that p-value of that test is very small, okay? It's 10 to the negative five, very small. In, uh, mo, mo, most, uh, you know, trying to reach a zero. So because that p-value, okay, and I did a, a little boo-boo here, so I have to correct it. <laughs> if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, that means that we reject that null hypothesis, which establishes that our null hypothesis is that the distribution, the, the distribution that, that the points have is Gaussian, is normal. We reject it for the argument, in other words, those uh, residuals are not behaving in a Gaussian uh, way. The second one is the QQ plot. Okay, and in the QQ plot, we're going to do basically the same thing, but with quantiles, okay? We're going to have the normal quantiles and then the residual quantiles. And as you can see, this line, this band, this blue band, is going to be the confidence interval, you know, from the perfect line, which is, uh, three, three, uh, three positive and three minus. So, as you can see in the tails of that distribution, it goes off, you know, from those beds. Another indication that those residuals are not behaving uh, in a Gaussian, uh, as a Gaussian distribution. So the last test, and this is the one that is included. The, the other ones are not included in the book. This one is included in the book. Is the Eljum bug test. And the Elgin bug test, what it does is that it checks if any autocorrelation exists in a time series. In other words, because our residuals are time bound, we want to know if there's an independence or autocorrelation in those residuals. They should be independent, remember. So we uh, you know, for, for uh, performing this uh, Elgin bug test, we do the augment again, and then we're going to do the dot in of the innovative uh, residuals, and we're going to apply the Elgin bug, bug test with lags equal to 10. In other words, it's going to give you a series of lags. And the important thing here is this p-value, okay? So, this p-value is 0.04. That means that it's less, right, than the 0 0.05 threshold that we have. So that means that there is some kind of autocorrelation because if it was more than 0 0.05, that means that there is no uh, autocorrelation, okay? So, and we 
we can see it because there's one lag that is, you know, or uh, the, the autocorrelation is very significant. Okay, it's, it's not random in other words. So that the model is detecting that. This test is detecting that particular autocorrelation. All right, and any questions, comments so far? Yeah, all good. All good? It's important that when you, uh, you know, when we perform regression models, uh, we test the, you know, the residuals. We, we, we do the diagnostics because that tells you if the model is, you know, complying with those assumptions or not, okay? Because it can give you some, some problems when, when using as forecast, <laughs> all right? Uh, this is another, you know, uh, visual that the author uh, gives us, which is the residual plot against predictors. So here, what we're doing is uh, getting the residuals and then plot them against the, you know, the, obs the observed values of each of the predictors. And as you can see, more or less, okay, this pattern, in fact, there's no pattern. In other words, it, they're, they're just scattered around in that, you know, uh, you know, rectangle, right? So for income production, savings and unemployment, uh, we can say that at least because the random the the the, the plus uh, says that the 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 we cannot see a trend or we cannot see a pattern. That means that then you know we're satisfying the one of the assumptions. Okay, the assumptions that the 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 the, the residuals are behaving randomly. All right, even though we know that there are other assumptions that are not there. Right. Okay, and this is the residual plot, right, against the fitted values. And this one, what he wants to see if there, if there is a, there, there, there is a constant variance or, a, a, you know, a irregular, non-constant variance. In other words, that this, uh, this word, heteroscedasticity which means that the variance is not uniform. So we're trying to see if there is a pattern that tells you if the variance is not. In this plot, you cannot tell if the variance is, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is, is non-constant. In other words, we can say that the variance here, at least from this plot, that the variance is constant. All right, so that's not part of the, of the problem that we have. The problem we have is the autocorrelation uh, part and also the behaving of the residuals that are, that are not caution, all right? Okay. Remember, in time series, as in regular, you know, tabular data, uh, you have to watch for outliers. The problem is that it's not very easy to determine what is an outlier in a time series or not. Uh, maybe we can, you know, get this, this, when we discuss other models, because you have to, you know, you, you need some domain knowledge in terms of the data and how the data behaves in the past to, you know, establish what is the threshold for a, for a, for an outlier. Because not only is spike is an outlier, spike could be, you know, could be a, uh, uh, could be explained, okay, but depending on the on the pattern, the historical pattern, and your knowledge of what's you know causing that, then you can determine if there's an outlier or not. And for example, in COVID, the COVID period that, that we had, uh, we know that the time series of a lot of uh, you know uh, indicators uh, behave you know uh, out of their pattern. But the problem is that it was a long period. Okay, it was almost two years. So can you say that all those are outliers? Or you can say that within those periods, you can identify certain outliers, okay? So in time series, it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's more like an arm in terms of how do you identify outliers or not. In regular data, 
you can have the box plots, uh, you can have this, and you can have this too uh, here, but it's not that evident, okay? So there's some method uh, methodologies, for example, the log transformation, box code transformation, uh, standardization, et cetera, that minimizes that, that, uh, that issue. But outliers could be, uh, could be a source of, uh, of headache for, especially for regression models, because we know that regression models are uh, susceptible to uh, outliers. They tend to pull, okay, the the line to a certain to a certain place in the in that space. All right. Okay, so that's basically a discussion of the outliers and inferential observation. That's another topic. Okay. In fact, in time series, most of the time the outliers are called anomalies. It's a different uh, <laughs> it's a different uh, denomination here. Anomalies, and there's ways you know to to deal with them. Okay, the other one that the author talks is about spurious regressions, and spurious regressions, it can be explained by what is what is called spurious correlations. And I took this website from another webinar that they were talking about this, and this one is very interesting. Okay, let me open the tab on these spurious correlations. So spurious correlations, what it means that there are two phenomena that they can be highly correlated, but you know by your expertise, you know, by your, uh, you know, by your acquired knowledge, your wisdom, that those things are totally, you know, unrelated. But in the, in, in the correlation formula, they behave highly correlated. Okay, so let, let's see a couple of examples. Okay, let's have the US spending on science, space, and technology through time, right? And plotted. This is the this is the red line. And we're going to see another line, which is suicide by hanging, strangulation, or suffocation. And that's going to, to be the black line. All right. And as you can see, there is a correlation of 99.79, almost one. <laughs> Okay, almost perfect. Okay, so can we say that more spending on US science, space and technology is going to cause more suicides? Is that true? Africa, tell me. <laughs> oh. Of course not, right? I mean, unless we are missing something here, I don't think there's any correlation, any relationship or causation between suicides and you know US spending in, in, in any in any thing. The only thing that they go, you know, that they're going up, they're, they're increasing, you know, in, in certain, you know, in, in, in the period that we are we're talking about. Okay, another one, which is very interesting. Number of people who drown by falling into a pool. Okay, and we have, you know, the time series. That's the that's the red. Then we have films that Nicolas Cage appeared in, okay? And we have another one. And this one, even though it's not that high correlated, but it has some correlation, 66.66%, which is, you know, acceptable. So the, the thing is, that can we say that when people, you know, more people drown into a pool, that means that Nicolas Cage is going to appear in more movies? I don't think so, <laughs> okay? So the, you know, the, the thinking here is, okay, the, 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 the conclusion here is, there are certain phenomena, okay, out there. There are certain phenomena out there that they can be highly correlated. That doesn't mean that one causes the other, okay? And this is an example of correlation is not causation. In other words, correlation is a mathematical formula that tells you how related are two uh, numerical vectors. That that's it. That, that, that you know you cannot you cannot apply anything else. Okay, it's going to tell you how how you know related are. That doesn't mean that one causes the other. In fact, most of the time it doesn't happen that way. Okay. So, uh, a word of advice, you know, in time series you could have time series that apparently they're highly correlated, but they are you know they don't have any anything to do you know be, be, between them. Okay, so you know, watch. I I I I said it. 
All right, what time do we have? Because this is a long chapter. Okay, we have three, so and my voice is getting a little bit, you know, it's a disappearing. <laughs> we, we can even uh, uh, like uh, do the next time. Termine. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we can continue it and then also we can do the exercise. And the exercise that we, I uh, suggest to do is the first one. It's uh, this one, the half hour electricity demand for Victoria, Australia, okay? So maybe what we can do is uh, look at the material that we are still, you know, uh, missing, but then try to see if we can, you know, uh, accommodate this exercise. So we can, you know, shoot two, you know, two things in from one, from one stone. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So uh, have, a, have a great weekend, uh, Federica, and I'll see you Thank then you. on March 31st. Okay. <laughs> I hope Bye. that the time change does not, you know, disturbs yeah. your peace. <laughs> okay. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.